Hey, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope I don't bore you too much after these uh, very uh, detailed technical talks. So, um, this one will be a lot easier, I think, because I'm not sure how it works with the quality. If you want, you can also follow this uh, presentation online if you have a, a computer. So, it's a bit of an older version, but if you go to amuller.github.io, you can actually see this online. I'm not sure how good you can read it over the Hangout. OK, anyhow, yeah, so this is about uh, machine learning with scikit-learn. And um, so, I mean, I'm not sure, like, what all your, your background is. So this is really, like, kind of going for a very broad audience. So what I want to talk about is first some very basic concepts of machine learning, um, then introducing scikit-learn and how it works and the API. Um, present just some very basic algorithms and um, how to do model selection using scikit-learn, and then walking through a real-world application for uh, working with text data. So uh, maybe uh, just a little word about scikit-learn. So it's a collection of machine learning algorithms and tools. So um, uh, maybe I can just skip to the, uh, to the website. The website has a lot of cool documentation. Um, nah, maybe I can't skip to the website. OK, never mind. Um, and there's like all the uh, standard algorithms that you would expect, like from classification, um, random forest boosting, linear classifiers, SVMs, um, yeah, all, all kind of things, snake base. Uh, and uh, also, like, uh, dimensionality reduction, regression, manifold learning, uh, feature selection, all these things. But um, actually what is more in the recent years becomes more framework and tools to easily build models and deploy models in uh, real-world applications. Um, can you maybe mute the mic? I can hear myself talk. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Thanks. OK. Um, yeah, so it's BSD licensed and uh, like the whole uh, scientific Python ecosystem. And so it's used both in academia and industry. So here this list is a bit older. It shows Spotify, Bitly, Evernote. But there's also like, uh, yeah, I don't know, Twitter uh, and Amazon and all kind of uh, other companies using this now in production. Um, there's about 20 core developers. And per release, there's about 200 people contributing. And we're really proud of our uh, code quality and documentation. So if you want go on the website, scikit-learn.org, you will see that there's really a lot of documentation and examples. And we really want people to contribute. It's a very, yeah, it's a very open um, community. So you can just join the mailing list if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so bear with me for a second. So this is just very, uh, very basic stuff. I mean, there's kind of three kinds of learning, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Scikit-learn covers only the first two, only supervised and unsupervised learning, uh, with a slight focus on supervised learning. So um, yeah, what is supervised learning? We have some training data set at, uh, that we call X-train, and we have some output that we want to infer. Uh, Y-train, which could be like in classification, some discrete labels or regressions or some continuous labels. And uh, we were given some new data, x test. We want to predict y test, the labels of this uh, uh, new data. And yeah, so as I said, there's classification, regression, and ranking are kind of the standard applications here. In unsupervised learning, basically, you're just given x, and you want to learn something about x. And there's no train test split in a way. So uh, classic examples are dimensionality reduction, uh, clustering, and manifold learning. Um, so, I mean, there, there's, uh, I created this cheat sheet, which was kind of popular for some reason that I don't really understand, which kind of shows you which algorithms are implemented in scikit-learn, uh, and kind of when you would want to use which algorithms. If you can, uh, if you want, you can, like, Google scikit-learn cheat sheet, and you will find that out. So um, today, I will mostly talk about classification and a bit about dimensionality reduction. Uh, but kind of the rest all works the same, which is one of the great things about scikit-learn. It basically, you can just exchange your learning algorithms very, very easily. So in scikit-learn, uh, basically everything you, uh, 
you work on is a NumPy array. So for a SciPy sparse matrix, which is basically the same, but just sparse. And so um, it's just a, a big numerical array. That's all uh, representation that scikit-learn really works with. And uh, so we s let's start with some toy data. So there's uh, some data sets that come with scikit-learn, for example, digits data set. And uh, yeah, if we load that, we can see there's like um, the uh, images are like 1,797 uh, times 8 times 8. And there are some targets, which are 1,797. And so these uh, images are just like 8, eight by 8 grayscale images. And um, the labels are some numerical labels from uh, 0 to 9, just saying which digit this is. And uh, so that we can learn, uh, actually work with this data and scikit-learn, we kind of have to reshape it to uh, put it into a um, shape of the number of features times, uh, sorry, number of samples times the number of features. So there's kind of a 1,700 something uh, uh, digits in this data set. And these 8 times 8 pixels are uh, 64 features. And um, so our labels here are uh, these outputs. Uh, these are just these uh, 1,700. And so in scikit-learn, uh, one thing that you should kind of remember is sort of uh, your data is always in this array, and it's always number of samples times number of features. And sort of whenever you use scikit-learn, this is always how the data will be represented. I mean, sometimes, in a way, this is kind of a restriction to only represent data in this way, but it also makes uh, the interface very easy and very flexible and very easy to use. Um, yeah, OK, so you have you access some data matrix. And this is just the digits kind of uh, flattened out. So the first thing I uh, like to do when I get some new data set that is uh, take a look at it. I mean, there's um, various ways how you can visualize data. Uh, but um, the one I want to go for here is just doing a dimensionality reduction and then plotting the points. So each of these digits is a, 64 dimension, is a point in a 64-dimensional space, which is kind of hard to look at. I mean, another way to visualize it is look at the individual dig digits as these 8 times 8 images. That's obviously quite easy and nice, but you can't look at all of them at the same time, really. Um, so the way I want to do this is I want to uh, project these points down to two dimensions, because in two dimensions we can draw points, like on a canvas, because it, like our monitor is two-dimensional. So the easiest way to project down data to a two-dimensional uh, space is uh, using a linear method, uh, most common woman is PCA. So this will be the first time we use scikit-learn now. Um, all algorithms are kind of encapsulated in a class, so we import a class uh, called PCA, and then we create a model of this class, um, which is, yeah, we create this object PCA from, uh, with type PCA, and we give it some parameters in this, uh, in, uh, yeah. This time we want to say uh, we want to go down to two dimensions. So we say we want to get two PCA components, and um, then we want to estimate the model for the data we have. Um, so x is our data that we have, our digits, and we call PCA that fit. And uh, then we want to um, use this model that we just estimated and um, get the embedding. And this is uh, using transform. And so. Uh, the thing that we get back is this XPCA, uh, which is still uh, these uh, 1,800 uh, digits, but now it's, they live in two-dimensional space. Uh, it's a linear projection down. Um, so this is, uh, scheme is kind of very, very common it's for all uh, algorithms in scikit-learn that you have. Basically, you, you import your model, then you um, instantiate your model with some parameters, you fit it to the data, and then you, then you apply it. And so now we can look at the uh, digits in a projected down space. And just give me a second. OK, yeah. Um, so uh, this is just sort of the first principal component against the next principal component. And I colored them with their labels. So you can see that uh, kind of just using this unsupervised methods of projecting down to the um, principal components, this uh, some of the classes are actually quite well separated. Like I don't know how good you can see this, but here's like the blue class, the class, the yellow class, and the green class. I don't know what numbers they are, but you can see that these are quite easy to distinguish, even in this low dimensional space. But some other classes are mixed up here. Um, so 
Um, we can also inspect this model that we estimated uh, from the data. So the interesting aspects of the PCA model are uh, the mean and the components that we projected to. So the mean is 64 dimensional, and the components are, so we have two components, each 64 dimensional. And yeah, we can just sort of reshape them back because the 64 dimensions correspond to the uh, 8 times 8 image. And so we can get here, this is the 8 times 8 image corresponding to the mean on the left, and then the first two components. And uh, so you can kind of look at them, and they kind of make sense in this image space um, to look at them. Uh, so, I mean, this is like an average digit, and this something maybe covers some uh, shape kind of like a 3 or an 8, and the other one is like, is, is, it, is there something in the middle of the num digit or not? So, I mean, if you want, you can, uh, can do some discussion of that or not. Uh, but you can inspect what the model is actually doing. So, uh, to uh, see how easy it is to kind of switch from one model to the other, just Let's do the same thing with isomap. So isomap is a, a nonlinear uh, manifold learning technique. So this um, allows you to go down to two dimensions from this 64-dimensional uh, space uh, in a nonlinear way. So again, you import it. You uh, set the parameters. You say you want to go down to two dimensions. There's another parameter I adjusted so, just so, so the image looks nice. And um, yeah, then we fit the model again. Uh, same way, and we apply the model, which is transform, and then we get back X isomap, which has the same shape as XPCA, but uh, now it's kind of, it's a nonlinear transform, it looks a bit differently, and uh, some classes are even better separated. And if I have to guess, I would say this is the zero, and this is the one class, because they are so well separated. And this is often an interesting way to look at your data. Okay, but now, uh, let's go to some sort of uh, yeah, let's go to classification uh, from this visualization. And um, so as I said, there's a lot of classifiers and um, in scikit learn you can use, but just some yeah, b uh, basic uh, things. I mean, obviously, you want to do split your data into uh, training and test parts. And uh, before you do anything, I can't say this enough because people always evaluate in the training set, as we just heard before uh, in the text talk, I think, at the end. So I always repeat that. Uh, there's a very simple function that gives you some randomized split in scikit-learn, and then kind of you can, can uh, start developing your model on the training set. And so, yeah, I think by default you get something like 75%, 25% uh, being maintained test split, and now we have uh, 1,300 samples the training set and the labels for them and uh, 450 samples and test set and labels for them. So these are still digits. And uh, one of my favorite classifiers, because it's very simple and easy to understand, is the uh, linear SVM. And so to do classification with scikit-learn, uh, we again import the model. Um, okay, linear SVM finds linear separation between the classes. We instantiate the model again. We could use some parameters here if we wanted to. And um, then we can fit the model using uh, our known labels. So, um, yeah, uh, for supervised algorithms, the fit takes both the uh, data and the labels. And uh, this is the same for all the supervised algorithms. And to apply uh, the model, we now uh, use uh, predict. So all supervised uh, algorithms have this predict. The unsupervised ones have transform, to transform data. And, um, Okay, so for the training data X train, we get out some digits that are predicted, and uh, there's also directly a model, uh, a function to uh, evaluate the model, which is score, which gives you just the uh, zero one score, so the accuracy of oh, sorry uh, uh, yeah of um, uh, the class you predicted, and on the training set, it's pretty good. It's 99% correct, but what you actually care about, obviously, is on the test set. So, and you can see even on the test set, this linear classifier does quite well. It's like 96% uh, uh, correct. And um, before we go into how to do model selection, just uh, using a slightly different classifier, RAM Forest classifier. So, I mean, you probably noticed, builds many decision trees and averages their results. So to instantiate the model. It's, again, the same. You instantiate the class with some parameters, maybe. You fit the model uh, with X-train and Y-train. Then you can evaluate it in the same way. 
This fits even better the training set, nearly 100%, and it basically has the same accuracy on the test set. Um, so, I mean, this way you can really, really easily tr uh, prototype uh, and use multiple algorithms, compare the algorithms, just plug in one for the other. Um, and, but to uh, really do a good model selection, I mean, we don't want to compare these on the test set because then we are um, biased or the decision we'll make will be biased. So what we actually want to do is we want to first make all of our choices and then in the end um, make the decision which classifier do we want to use, which parameters do we want to use. There's an inbuilt cross-validation that uh, allows us to do this in scikit-learn. So um, to select the parameters, we actually should only use the training set. So using this function uh, cross -val score in uh, uh, scikit-learn, you can give it a an estimator, so for example, the random forest that we just looked at, and uh, some data, so X train and Y train, and you can t tell it what kind of cross validation it should do. So this does five fold cross validation, and then if you call this function, it will run the cross validation for you, and it uh, outputs here the scores. So you can see the mean score is 93%, uh, and, and the standard deviation is actually quite small, so this, uh, uh, there's very little variation between the folds. Um, and now we can uh, see if you want to like select the model or parameters, you can uh, slightly change the model and see how it uh, will perform. So, for example, we can uh, use more trees in this uh, random forest. By default, I think it's 10. Now we use 50, and we run a cross validation again, and we see that the performance uh, goes from 94% uh, to 97%. Um, and sort of if we uh, did this on a test set, we would get uh, two optimistic uh, performance measures. So if we do this on a test set, then we'll select the better one. We might be f uh, make, uh, fit overfitting this uh, decision to test set. So you should always kind of do cross-validation and training set to uh, select your models and your parameters. But usually there's a lot of parameters to select, so you don't want to do uh, manual selection. For example, yeah, for maximum depth of the trees or for regularization of your classifier, and there's a way to do this automatic, automatically in scikit-learn, which is a, a grid search cross-validation class. And um, yeah, let's let's look at the linear SVM again because it has a very it just has one uh, parameter, which makes it quite simple. And it's uh, you should always cross-validate all your parameters, basically, or at least the important ones, and seize the one that you should always cross-validate for with SVMs. And uh, to do the cross-validation uh, or the grid search and cross-validation with scikit-learn, you first have to define what kind of parameters you want to uh, search over. So here I define a dictionary, which is um, I look at the par uh, so I want to adjust the parameter c, and I use uh, 10 to the power of some range of minus 3 to uh, 4. So it's a logarithmic uh, uh, grid going from uh, minus 10 to the 3 to minus uh, 2 plus 10 to the 3. And then I instantiate this uh, grid search class, um, which takes uh, um, the an model that I want to evaluate, in this case the SVM. It takes the parameters that I want to try out, so in this case all these different Cs, uh, how much cross-validation I want to do, and then I just I'll do some verbosity stuff. And then I can just call fit on this. This uh, grid search is now behaves kind of like a supervised uh, learning algorithm, so it also has this fit and predict. And if I call fit on this, I can uh, see that it runs, um, yeah, for three different cross-validation folds, it tries out all the parameters. And um, because the data is very small, it's quite quick. And then in the end, I can ask what's the best score and uh, what's the best parameters, and the best score for the linear SVM was, um, yeah, 96%, and the best uh, parameter is C, equal to 1. Um, yeah, M maybe just a little wor uh, word on... Um, uh, okay, I mean, it's also very easy using scikit-learn to uh, evaluate or not only to uh, look at the best parameter, but also to compare validation error and training error. So here, this is just uh, 
plotting the different sc the scores from the grid search I just did. And um, so I see for the different values of C that uh, kind of with low C, both training and validation error are bad. And with high C, basically the validation error goes down. Um, and the training, sorry, the, sorry, this is accuracy, not error. OK, so the, the error, so the accuracy is low for low values uh, for both of them. But uh, the accuracy is high for uh, less regularization for the training set, but low for the validation set. I mean, you can, this is like a textbook curve where you can see um, on this side, there's underfitting. You regularize too strongly, and you're not able to capture all the data on this side. You see that um, you, you regularize too little, um, and you're overfitting on the training set, but you're getting worse on the validation set. And there's some sweet spot in between. So I mean, this is very useful analysis to do, I think, uh, whenever you run some machine learning algorithm. And it's very easy to do this in scikit-learn, just looking at the um, values that you get back from cross-validation. Uh, from the grid search. Yeah, OK. I just said that. Um, OK, and now um, I want to finish up with um, um, this application that I did. So it was just kind of an afternoon hack doing a, taking part in a chemical competition. But I think it's kind of a useful and very uh, real application. It uh, This was about detecting whether a post in an online forum was offensive or not. Basically, if, uh, it's kind of think of it as YouTube commands or something where people swear at each other all the time, and you maybe want to uh, remove these uh, com uh, comments that are uh, yeah, uh, too aggressive or use swear words or something like that. Um, and so. Yeah, so I will, we'll use a, a simple bag of word model here and uh, just linear classifier to see how this works in principle. Um, so, I mean, the, the text comes in some CSV file, which is, I mean, okay, if you have small dots data, maybe it's a bit common. And so, um, well, we read it with pandas. Actually, I wanted to go a bit more into pandas, and you should really look at it if you. Uh, work more with, in particular, with categorical data or with data with different types. Pandas is very useful, but I didn't have time to cover it now. Um, so, yeah, so we read data from the CSV file, and um, basically there's, uh, it consists of some text and some uh, uh, label that says, is, is this an insult of a person or not? So um, here this, uh, why train is now a binary label 0, 1. This is an insult. And the commands train are just um, uh, some text. So these are both uh, about 4,000 samples. And yeah, so this is like uh, one uh, example uh, of how these commands look. And this is an insult. And so that's the sample and the label. Um, OK, there's a different uh, sample, um, which is not an insult, just randomly picked. Um, so, as I said, everything in scikit-learn is this uh, uh, number of samples times number of features representation. So, to actually um, use the learning algorithms, we need to first transform the data into this matrix format. And uh, for text data, there is something in scikit-learn to help you do that, which is just um, using a back-of-word model. It's a Kahn vectorizer, uh, which is kind of the most simple NLP feature extraction you could do. So uh, what you do is, uh, for those that maybe are not so familiar with uh, uh, text data, is you create a dictionary of all words that appear in your training set. And then for each sample, you count how often a word occurs. Here again, we have the same API that we had before for the uh, classifiers and for the PCA. We instantiate the model, and we call fit to um, estimate the parameters of this uh, back of word model. And this basically creates the vocabulary. And we can get the feature names here, which are the vocabulary entries. And they're ordered, so they're not so interesting at the beginning. It's like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And Obama spelled was a 0. But if you look at the middle, you can just get all kind of different words that appear in the uh, data set. And um, then we used uh, transform again to uh, 
take all the uh, input text data, these co uh, comments in a training set, and transfer it uh, to a vectorized representation. Um, so here, the sh shape of these vectorized um, representation is against four th nearly 4,000 elements, and the feature dimensionality is uh, yeah, 16,000, which is a lot higher than digits we had before. And if we remember what the first uh, sample was here, this is the um, representation of this first sample. Um, so there's only four words, so there's four non-zero entries. Um, so there was uh, one word we're starting with D, which is quite at the beginning, one with F, and two uh, starting with uh, Y, which are quite at the end. And for each of these words, there's a one, because all the words appeared only once. And this is kind of the vector representation. So it's all zeros, except of these four places where it is uh, one. OK, now that we have this uh, data matrix, we can just train a classifier. And um, yeah, we use linear classifier, and it's very, which is very efficient for the space sparse data. So uh, again, you just instantiate the model with some parameters that we call fit, and then we call. Um, uh, then we can do the same on the test set. So I didn't actually do the model selection here; I did this offline. Uh, so again, we call just the uh, CV uh, dot transform. So this was the uh, back of word model that we estimated before, and we transform it to a vectorized representation X test, and we have the labels of the. Uh, whether these data is insults or not in Y test. And um, then we can see what is the accuracy of this model, this very simple model, and it's uh, 83%. And that's actually uh, not that bad. It's, uh, OK, it's maybe like 8% from the best in the scoring in the, comp in the competition. And when I ran this, uh, I was the second place for a, bit, a while just using this model, which takes uh, less than 10 lines to implement. And uh, yeah, OK, so we can look at some. Uh, I want to fix this. No, never mind. OK, so here's an example where the prediction is wrong. Uh, but OK. But what I actually want to look at is uh, this. So this is, uh, again, visualizing the um, state of the model, what got estimated during training. So a linear classifier has this coefficients, which is as many as there's sample, uh, as there's features. And OK, so maybe you shouldn't like look too much at the code. Basically, what I did is the, I take the uh, ones, the coefficients that have the largest absolute values, the 50, uh, yeah, the 50 largest absolute values, just like the um, 50 highest co uh, coefficients. And I use. Um, to get feature names of the uh, count vectorizer, and then I get um, here the coefficients and uh, plotted, so yeah, against uh, the actual words. And you can see here uh, the words that are very strong, strongly against being an um, insult, which are better, law, fence, right, game, and yes something like that. And uh, the ones that are actually strong for insult are uh, die, pussy, pathetic, sister, mom, uh, idiot, and so on. So um, yeah, so you might wonder why there's sister and mom in there. Um, well, so I, I like this very much because it's a very intuitive uh, result. And you can very easily visualize uh, what these coefficients mean. Um, yeah. So, and as I said, I mean, I um, kind of left out the grid search here. So actually, we should have, uh, I set a C there basically by hand. Uh, we should grid search the parameter C. And um, then there's uh, methods in scikit-learn to build pipelines, which allow you to um, create new, uh, new classifiers from a, um, a set of different transformations. So we could put the uh, vectorization and the classifier in the same uh, model and do grid search over parameters of both of them, and uh, yeah, or combine different feature extraction methods. Okay, uh, I mean, this was very introductory, but still, I mean, here's sort of the takeaway message that I want to give from this uh, quick tutorial is that kind of to use scikit-learn, you should always 
need first to get your data into an array of uh, size and samples and features. And uh, the API is always very simple, it's always fitting the model and then calling either predict for supervised models or transform for unsupervised models um, and score to score the model. And so you should always do cross-validation and grid search, and it's very, very easy to do grid search for models. As you saw, it's just one line, and uh, there's really no reason not to use it. And you should always, before you do anything, split off your test set in the beginning. OK. I think that's it. And I hope you learned a little, at least a little bit, maybe a little bit about how scikit-learn works. Um, uh, yeah. Any questions?